This will be our next to last presentation for the day. Rod MacArthur will complete his uh, two, two lessons by, as you can see, Daniel or Daniel's last days. You know, I just kind of got the sneaky suspicion that if you conflate, that is, if you join together uh, William's lesson on the last hour, the hour of glory, with Rod's two lessons, especially this lesson on Daniel's last days, I just kind of suspect you'll have some pretty good stuff there. All right, Rod, why don't you come on up? Like I said, uh, I don't think any further introduction is necessary. Uh, I, I know that you enjoyed Rod's first lesson because I heard you saying so, both to him and to me, and we appreciate that. We, we want to bring you people that will feed all of us. And uh, like I said, Rod was here about four years ago or something like that, and I knew that it was time to have him back. So without any further ado, we'll give you Rod MacArthur again. How's that? Yes, very good. I can still read it. Um, we need a clock back there. Yeah. Gotta get a get a clock. Maybe. Well, you got me right here. I know, but. And the clock here doesn't show either. Uh, I, was, I was looking at the schedule, and after me is a catered dinner, 45 minutes after me. There is some time gap there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's after that, at least according to this. All right. I got a, an email from uh, my good friend Sam Dawson just two days ago. He said he apologized and was not going to be able to make it here. I so wanted to spend some time with him. I have known him since before I got married, and in February I will have been married 50 years. So I've known Sam a good long time. Yeah, you, you need to be clapping for the woman I left at home. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I grew up in a tradition in which the last days was explained. It wasn't exegeted, it was explained. See, see it, it was explained kind of like this. This is the Reader's Digest version, all right? You had the days from Adam to Moses, we call them the patriarchal days. Then you had the days from Moses to Jesus, and we call them the mosaical days. Then you had the days from Jesus' first coming to his second coming, and we call them the last days, because you got the first and the middle and the last. I had the great privilege of being this isolated preacher. And what I mean by I got the little bitty town 200 miles away from wherever any big preachers were. So I didn't get the privilege of uh, picking up the crumbs at their feet. If I'm going to teach something, I've got to study it out myself. And so I was studying through the book of Daniel and I scratched my head and said, wow, everything I've been taught about the last days is in what Daniel believed. It was not. Um, from the Bible, it was just a way to explain what that word meant, because nobody knew. Anyway, I, I, I want this lesson, and I've got something special in mind with this lesson, not just to work through Daniel and see some things, but, but there's, there is a very, um, well, let me look at this chart here. Finally free. You see that come up? Finally free. That... The, the last days that Daniel predicted were days that would finally set the kingdom of God free from the domination of wicked men and get back to what God had intended. You remember what, you remember what God told Samuel when the people clamored for a king? They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me 
from being king over them. Now, that particular rejection did not stop with the appointment of King Saul. It continued to intensify and worsen and deepen. And what happened is the more they rebelled, the harsher the rule and dominance of man over them became until God finally set them free at the end so he could be king over them. And when we talk about the last days of Daniel, we're talking about the days in which God set his people free from the domination of man to the loving, tender shepherding of a shepherd king called Jesus. Israel was warned in uh, uh, Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 31. I know Moses about to take them into the prom edge of the promised land. Joshua took them in, brought them right up to the edge of the promised land, gave them this wonderful book called Deuteronomy. It was a, uh, an exhortation, an encouragement, a, a motivation. You've got to follow Yahweh. It will be good. He, he, he beat these kings, Og and Sion, and he'll beat those kings, and he'll give you this. And it was, but you've got to follow him. And if you don't, well, toward the end of the book, we have the Song of Moses that ends with the vengeance of God against his enemies, the final days of Israel as we have seen in, in a couple different demonstrations or presentations. But he warned them, if you don't follow, you're going to be scattered. That's in, in Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 31. I'll give you that, let you read it. Uh, in Deuteronomy 28, 64 and 65, the curses that I talked about this morning, he said the same thing. You will be scattered. That was the, kind of the final thing. That one I do want to read. And so let's so, open our, uh, our Bibles here to Deuteronomy 28. In verse 64 and 65, Moreover, the Lord will scatter you among all the peoples from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, land, land. Um, and there you will serve other gods, wood and stone, which you or your fathers have not known. And among those nations you shall find no rest. Didn't, uh, didn't our brother Kyle point out that the rest was accomplished in Jesus? You'll have no rest uh, there, but that's where you're going to be. And, and so, uh, no resting place for the sole of your foot, but Yahweh will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes, and despair of soul. Not what he wanted for him but what they brought upon themselves. Now, there's this wonderful passage in Isaiah where people were mocking Isaiah, you know, even and making fun of him. And so God says, well, you're not going to listen to my prophet Isaiah. Then you are going to listen to people whose language you don't understand. Uh, they say, to whom would he teach knowledge? This is, uh, Isaiah 29, to whom would he teach knowledge and to whom would he impart the message? Those weaned from milk, those taken from the breast. In other words, he's just a kid. He's just got kid message. You know, maybe Mr. Rogers or somebody like that. For he says, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. Indeed, okay, now here's God's response. Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips and a foreign tongue. For he said, here is rest, give rest to the weary and here is repose, but they would not listen. They wouldn't listen to them when I spoke to them in Hebrew. So I'm going to speak to them with a stammering tongue. What, what am I really trying to say? Is that God didn't want them to be ruled by anybody but himself. He allowed them to be ruled by the kings, but that was part of the rebellion. He says, however, when you get wicked, I'm going to scatter you. And here in the days of Isaiah... They're about to go into places where they would be ruled by other nations. And you say, what's this got to do with Daniel? I'll show you what I think it has to do with Daniel. It has to do with the metal man dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. In Daniel 2.28, now we're not going to go through that dream because of uh, Don's got the whip and the, time, and the stopwatch. And I, I want to get through this. But 
you know the dream. And the king said, well, I, I don't understand the dream. Nobody can tell me the dream. Finally, Daniel says, there's a God in heaven who can tell you the dream. Let's turn. We're going to do some work in Daniel now. In chapter 2 and verse 28, very important passage, uh, significant Ezekiel's before Daniel. There it is. Okay. Daniel 2. However, verse 28, however, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made, he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall take place in the latter days. Whoa, literally in the end of the day. Have you ever wondered what days were coming to an end? Clearly it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar's days, was it? There's a head of gold and the chest of silver and the thigh of bronze and the legs of, of iron and iron mingled with clay. Four kings. Surely we're not talking about the end of Nebuchadnezzar's days. This is further than that. This is down when a stone would hit that statue and uh, crush that statue. Uh, and so four kingdoms were represented here. And here's an interesting thing. In verse um, 44, it says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. I want to pick up that phrase, coming back to the others in a minute, but he says, not left to a, which means that these previous kingdoms leaving their people to another kingdom. You know, the demographic didn't change when the rulership changed. All the, pe all the citizens of Babylon didn't just die when the Medo-Persians took over. It's just the Medo-Persians took over the populace. And so the kingdom was left to another king left to another empire, left to another domain. But when God set up his kingdom, he said, that's not going to happen to mine. That will not happen to mine. And so in verse 44, where we just read, in the days of those four, God would set up a kingdom, another kingdom, which would never be destroyed and which would not be left to another. So there's, there's an, an end, but at the end, there's a beginning. I mean, we, we've established this several times already in, in, the, in the seminar that the kingdom of Jesus has no end. But something came to an end in, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, okay? And so uh, we're going to take a look then. Uh, more at this, that, that in verse 45, it says, Inasmuch as you saw a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands. By the way, that phrase, without hands, you'll see that over and over. A circumcision made without hands. A temple made without hands. And over and over. That means God did it. This wasn't of human origin. So this stone uh, cut by God, that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, crushed them all together. You know, there's people who are waiting for the Roman Empire to be re, what do you call it, re, re, re solidified, re, uh, uh, revived, re, brought, re, reconstituted. That's the word I was looking for, reconstituted. Uh, well, if you're going to re, if you got to reconstitute, you got to reconstitute the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, the the Babylonian, all because it, it it smashed them all, right? It smashed them all at the same time. Now, <clears throat> detractors, uh, let me let me back away from that that word. Uh, there there's some object to the kingdom, uh, the 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 picture of Daniel being fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem. And, and the reason is, well, the Roman Empire didn't fall then, did it? And, and it didn't. And the Roman Empire kept on for several hundred years after that. I don't believe that the context is dealing with the physical fall of that empire. It's not the fall of Rome, but it is, watch this, um, it is the deliverance of God's people from 
the metal man dominion. They have not rejected you, they've rejected me. And so for a series of several hundred years, God's people were dominated by a human king who became wickeder and wickeder and more and more and more corrupt until God put this metal man image, the Babylonians, uh, the Medo-Persians, uh, the, the Grecians, and the Romans to dominate and shepherd his people until the Christ could come. But then a stone came, the Christ, smashed this image and set his people free from that dominion. And so it's really a talking not about the collapse of the Roman Empire, but the collapse of the control of Rome over the kingdom of God. That, that's, that's the way I see it. And so <clears throat> that's Nebuchadnezzar's first dream. Now in chapter 3, which we're not going to deal with other than this one comment, in chapter 3 Nebuchadnezzar went out and made an image. I suspect that he's responding to this dream and demanding everybody to worship it. Well, of course, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego wouldn't do it. Uh, neither would Azariah, uh, Hananiah, and Mishael. They wouldn't do it either. But they, they wouldn't bow down. Okay? Then, Nebuchadnezzar had another dream. He had the tree dream, as I call it. And uh, you know the dream. I'm not going to go through the drill other than I want to read... Verse 17, so Daniel's in interpreting this dream. You know, you saw the tree, the great trees feeding everybody, and then it was angelic watcher says, cut it down, put a band around it. What does that mean? In verse 17, this is the sentence. This sentence is by the decree of the watchers. Whoever is watching out over God's people says this is what's going to happen. And the decision is a command of the Holy Ones. So as we think about Nebuchadnezzar's lesson, what he's supposed to learn from this is that first of all, this sentence or decree came from heaven. And then secondly, it, was, it had a purpose. The living need to know something in order that the living may know that the Most High is the ruler over mankind and he bestows it on whom he wishes. Why, Nebuchadnezzar, are you the head of gold? Why will there be a chest and arms of silver? Say, why? Well, because the Most High rules. It's his choice. He put this in order. It's not you, King. It's the Most High. You need to learn that. And, of course, he did learn that. All right. So he uh, establishes his chosen to do that rule. Then Daniel had a dream. I had a dream. And in Daniel chapter 7, we're going to skip over the uh, handwriting on the wall. And we're going to skip over the lion's den. Those are interesting stories. But I want to follow this thought. That is, freedom in the last days. Freedom from the oppression of human rule over God's people. Now, you might think of all kinds of ecclesiastical organizations and setups where there is this oppressive human rule over God's people. This story is showing that that's what God was doing away with. All right? And so in Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, there were four beasts, and you can remember what they look like, and one little horn that, that came up. But then look at verse 9, Daniel 7, 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat, his vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A river of fire was flowing. When you see a river of fire coming from the throne, what do you think? Pardon? You think of a volcano. You know what I think? Judgment of God. This is God passing judgment. There's, there's two psalms. Uh, I think it's 89 and 94, that say, justice and righteousness are the foundation of your throne. One of them says, loving kindness and truth go before you, and how blessed are the people. The other one says, fire and thick darkness go before you and consume your adversary, both coming from the same throne. Okay, So here, a throne is set for judgment, and fire is coming. So God's not pleased 
with what he sees, and he, uh, the four beasts and the little horn, he's not pleased with what he sees, so he's going to pass judgment. Now, drop down to verse 17, because <clears throat> Daniel kept looking, he kept seeing things, and he's scratching his head, and he says, uh, my mind, verse 15, my mind kept alarming me. I, I walked up to somebody and says, what, is this, what does this mean? That's verse 16. And so he began to make the interpretation known to me. Verse 17 says, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings who will arise from the earth. That reminds us of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You, O king, are the, uh, are the king of kings. You are the head of gold. Well, not just King Nebuchadnezzar, but the entire Babylonian kingdom. And so also, these four beasts are four kings, four uh, different kingdoms, which will arise out of the land. But the saints, and so we've got the four uh, beasts uh, equal four kings, but the saints of the highest one, they'll receive the kingdom forever for all ages to come. So this is, this can't be the end. When they receive the kingdom, which doesn't end, the end can't be at the end of that, because it doesn't end. So the end is what gives them that. Something else comes to an end, so that they can have an unending kingdom, don't you see? Continuing in chapter 7, we have verses 21 and 22, which says, I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Highest One, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. So we have a, a, a possessing the kingdom. The saints took possession of it. It was no longer Jewish. It was no longer ruled by the metal man. It was ruled by Jesus and his saints. Look over here in uh, the book of Revelation with me. Uh, I, I love this. In Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 25. It says, Nevertheless, what you have, this is uh, to, to the church of Thyatira, he says, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13? The one who endures to the end is the one who will be saved. You remember what the Hebrews writer constantly, constantly urged and exhorted? Hold fast your confession. Hold fast. Here, Jesus, uh, Jesus says, hold fast. It's the same message. Hold fast until I come. And he who overcomes and who keeps my deeds until when? Until the end. To him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. What fascinates me about that reading right there? Is that the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 2? And that's talking about the rule of Jesus. Isn't it? You read Psalm 2, that's the rule of Jesus. Shadow the knee. We don't want him our, as our king. We don't want him. I'm going to set him up anyway. Heard that last night by, from somebody. I'm going to set him up anyway. But here, did you see it? Did you see it? Did you catch it? He who overcomes and who keeps my deeds. Now, the, the my is Jesus. And the he who overcomes is any Christian in the days of Jesus, who perseveres and endures the difficulties. To him I will give authority of the nations. In other words, he's going to rule the nations with me. He is going to be ruling the nations with me. But Jesus said in, John, in Revelation 22, verse 7, I am coming quickly. And we saw last night, I think it was last night, it all blurs together, that this idea of coming quickly is not the speed of the coming, but the soonness of it. It's not the speed. The word does not mean how the, the rapidity of, of the approach, 
but the soonness of the approach. Now, what am I saying? Uh, he says to them, to them, to the people in Thyatira, you keep my words until I come and you rule the nations with me. But in 2270, then I'm coming real soon. But here in the book of Daniel, at that judgment at the end, that's when the saints possessed the kingdom and were ruling with Jesus. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to take a look at, at Daniel's vision now in chapter 8. Moving on to chapter 8. Here's the ram and the goat vision. Verses uh, 3 through 8 tell you about the ram and the goat. And verse 20 says that the ram is the Medo-Persians. And verse 21 says that the goat are Greece, Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander had uh, four, actually he had five generals. Um, and I, one of them, when, when Alexander died, the other four killed the one. But they were left with a guy named Lysimachus, uh, Cassandra, uh, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And uh, Lysimachus took everything west of Greece, and Cassandra took, uh, Cassandra took everything east of Greece, and uh, Seleucus took the uh, Palestinian area, and Ptolemy took Egypt. And from the point of view of the Holy Land, the king of the north would be the Seleucids, because they were just north of them. And the king of the south would be the uh, Ptolemies. And those two back and forth. I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get there. Okay. And so the four horns then became four kings from Alexander, the, the four that I, I told you about. Now, in verse 15, at first 15, uh, it, it came about that when I, Daniel, had seen the vision that I sought to understand. And now, why do you seek to understand something? For two reasons. Number one, you really want to know what you just heard. And number two, you don't know what you just heard. So he didn't understand it. Okay. And behold, standing there was one who looked like a man. And I heard a voice of the man between the books. And he called out and said, Gabriel! Give this man understanding of the vision. So Gabriel gave him an explanation. That's verses 16 through 19. Look at verse uh, 19. Actually, I, I want to look at uh, 17, 18, and 19. So he came near where I was standing, and, and when he came, I was frightened, fell on my face, and he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Okay, so I got a ram and a goat, and it pertains to the time of the end. It reminds me of Daniel 2, where Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that pertained to the latter days or the end of the days. This pertained to the time of the end. Stick with me, and we'll see where that goes. Okay, and while I was, he was talking with me, verse 18, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand upright, and he said, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final indication. So we've got this, um, we've got this time of the end, uh, and, and then here's this final indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. I guess that's why I lumped them together, because we have time of the end in there twice. But here, it's not just a time of the end, it's an appointed time of the end, and it comes when? At the final indignation. Uh, final indignation of what? And so we have to keep going with this thing. And so in verse uh, 23, and in the latter day, latter period of their rule. So the latter period of the four horns. The latter period. Not the beginning, which is right after Alexander died. Okay, Alexander being the, 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 the belly of, of, of brass. After he died, but not immediately after. At the latter period of these four generals who then had these four separate kingdoms. The latter period of that... When the transgressors, oh, so we have the death of Alexander and, and, and the rise of Rome. I, I say the rise of Rome because we have Cassandra basically out of the picture. Uh, Seleucus and Ptolemy back and forth. We'll see that in chapters 
uh, 10 and 11. But Lysimachus over here in the West, just kind of minding his own business, waiting until tall men sluice had weakened themselves enough, and then he comes in. We'll see him in chapter 11, verse 36. Um, but, but the rise of Rome. I think the latter period of these four horns is all the way down to the rise of Rome because it says here, when the transgressions have run their course. So we, we, we've got, um, got a period of time where the transgressors and the indignation uh, is filling up and filling up and filling up, which reminds me of Matthew 23, uh, where Jesus said, fill up then the measure of your fathers, so that how will you escape the sentence of Gehenna? Upon this generation will come all of, of the uh, righteous blood from Abel to Zechariah. You, you know that. And so uh, we have this filling up of the transgressions. See, the transgressors have run their course. But then Daniel was told in verse 26, you keep this vision secret. So we've, we've got Daniel's vision that pertains to your people at the time of the end. Now, in chapter 9, Daniel was reading in the book of Jeremiah. I don't know why he was reading in the book of Jeremiah. Maybe the book of the month club led him down and didn't send him something. But he's reading in the book of Jeremiah. And he happened to read. What did he happen to read? He says, I read... Verse 2, the number of the years as the word of Yahweh to Jeremiah, the prophet, for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, 70 years. Well, you'll find that in Jeremiah 25 as well as in Jeremiah 29, both places. So Daniel was reading and he, he realized that it's 70 years. Uh, and, and he started to pray. I'm putting two and two together, and I'm coming up with the, the, a number of somewhere between three and five, and decide that Daniel must be in that 70th year. And so he began to pray. And, and we have verses 3 through 19 is his prayer, but I want to especially notice verses 18 and 19. Um, Actually, uh, I, I should actually back up to 16, where he says, O oh, oh Yahweh, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people had become a reproach to all those around us. So, so now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. Uh, d d do you see the point I'm really driving at here? Daniel's prayer was very specific. It's the point I made on Joel this morning. It was personal, it was national, it was specific between God and Israel. It's your holy city, it's your holy mountain, it's your people, it's your sanctuary. And in chapter 9 at verse 21, he confessed his sin and the sin of his people. And one of our presenters uh, talked about that in, in relation to Jesus being baptized as a representation of the nation rather than for his own sins. And so Daniel's doing that here. Continuing with Daniel's prayer, in chapter uh, ver verse 24, now Gabriel's uh, answer, 20 through 23 is really great. You know, when you began to pray, I was sent. Uh, all you had to do, Daniel, is start this prayer. And I, I'm responding to you. Beautiful stuff, but I, I want to get to verse 24, <clears throat> where he says, uh, 70 weeks, 70 sevens have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy one. Uh, and so we, we've got this decree, but it's for your people and your holy city. And, and, and again, I'm calling attention to how narrow in scope this was. This wasn't for the whole world. This was for your people 
and for your holy city. In verse 25, they would restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And so the period of time from, and, and I don't care about the time spans. I'm not even going to try to touch that. I'm just looking at the content of the material. And so here's this, we're going to, there's a period of time to, from the issue to restore and rebuild Jerusalem down to Messiah. We understand that to be the, the, the period after they came back from their exile down to when Jesus came. How, whatever those numbers mean, uh, you know, figure that one out. I'm just looking at the, his, the, the flow of history here. Uh, to, so we're going to rebuild the Jerusalem and we're going to restore, uh, bring in Messiah. <clears throat> but then in verse 26, it says, Then after the 62 sevens, Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So <clears throat> rather than having Jeremiah 29, 70 years captivity and then we're going to rebuild the city and it's all going to be great and dead. Oh, whoopee. No. Then we're going to have the 77s and we're going to rebuild the city and restore it and get every bustle going on again and then it's going to be destroyed again. And then it will be destroyed again. Messiah will be cut off. Who cut Messiah off? The people of Israel. <laughs> Pull out your Bible. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, or chapter 2. And read with me verses 14 through 16. For you brothers, the brothers in Thessalonica, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. <coughs> Excuse me. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. The Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. Do you remember Matthew 23? I'm going to send you wise men and prophets. Some of them you'll kill. Some of them you'll persecute. That upon you may come. Okay. They did that. They did that. They're hostile to all men. Hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Watch this. With a result that they fill up the measure of their sins. What did we talk about? The transgression runs its course. The uh, uh, desolation becomes full. The uh, iniquity become full. Fill up the measure of their sin. But wrath has come upon them it says to the utmost literally to an end literally wrath has come upon them to an end and so we're cutting off the messiah was a time to bring the jewish people to an end that's what i'm saying and i think that's exactly well, paul got his message here from from daniel right and so then we we take a look then uh, again at verse 26 says the city will be destroyed. See, and he will come in and destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end with a flood. Hint, Revelation 12, the dragon issued a river, a flood to, to, to flood the woman, but it was, the, the land opened his mouth and helped the woman and the land absorbed the flood. The Roman Empire was the flood that was Satan wanted to kill the woman with, and God used it to destroy Jerusalem instead. Its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. So we have the city destroyed, and at its end, determined by God to, to do so. In verse 27, <clears throat> And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one seven, but in the middle of the seven, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, <clears throat> I think, so we have a complete decreed destruction, and I think the one who makes desolate here is a reference to the high priest. If you disagree with me, uh, take that up with Dawn when I'm back in Washington. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> now, Daniel from the, re the rest of the book is a message of the end. But, but here, uh, we, we saw that this glorious hope that Jeremiah presented sev uh, 70 years and you get to go back, this glorious hope of Jeremiah ended in complete destruction. But this is the theme through the book, isn't it? That at the Roman Empire, the, the feet of this statue, 
there would be a dissolution of the metal man's domination of God's people. In, in chapter 8, with the, with the, the goat and the ram, uh, the, the latter days of the four generals of Alexander, uh, there, there would be punishment for the indignation. And, and, and here, uh, Daniel's vision, after Jerusalem is rebuilt, there would be indignation and corruption, and it would be completely destroyed. So, I think Daniel wanted to know, well, what's that 77 period of time look like? And that may or may not be the case, but I believe chapters 10 and 11 and 12 tell us. It's a message of the end. Uh, Daniel 12, 10 through 12, a history to the end, likely the flushing out of the 77s. And in Daniel 10 at verse 14, I'm going to just hit a, 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 a couple thoughts here. And in Daniel 10, 14, here's Gabriel speaking again. He says, now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to your people. Now, we've already seen it's your city and your holy people. It's your temple. It's your sanctuary. It's your holy mountain. Now, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to your people when? At the end of the days. But that's what was in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The God in heaven has shown the king Nebuchadnezzar what's going to happen at the end of the days. Now Daniel is getting it direct from Gabriel. This is about your people at the end of the days. Now what's interesting, <clears throat> and I think, uh, I think this was in, in your message, Daniel. You were talking about Zionism and how people are trying to force uh, fulfillment. That started long ago. In chapter 11, we've got a couple, uh, we got, we got a couple kings sitting, uh, a Seleucid king and a Ptolemy king sitting at a table and uh, lying to each other and trying to bring something about. It's, but it says, but it will not succeed for the end is at the appointed time. It doesn't matter what man is trying to do. The end is going to come at the appointed time. And so I take great comfort in that, that uh, uh, this uh, Zionist uh, movement in the U.S. and trying to get the politics involved, it's not going to work. Uh, it's not going to work. All right. So uh, continuing the thought here in chapter 11 at verse 36. Now we've got the king of the north and we've got the king of the south going back and forth throughout all of chapter 11. I believe uh, that, uh, I mean, th this is amazing by the way, and skeptics hate this part, that you can actually take the history of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and the bickering back and forth and the intrigue and the intermarry, and you can map right onto Daniel 11. It's like, Daniel must have been written after the fact. And then until you get the Dead Sea Scrolls, and there's Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, what are we going to say about that? We can't have Daniel predicting the future so accurately and so precisely. But that's exactly what he did. But you got the king of the north, the Seleucids. You got the king of the south, the Ptolemies. And you got verse 36. Then the king, who's neither the king of the north nor the king of the south, he will come and do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god. He will speak monstrous things against the god of gods. He will prosper until the indignation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. So you got this big king. I think it's Rome. He's going to do monstrous things. He's going to prosper until the indignation is finished, because what was decreed will be done. So this got this, this, this uh, big uh, braggadocious uh, megalomaniac king of uh, Rome thinking he's really accomplishing something. God says, I just got you on my string. You're just doing what I want you to do. Now look down at verse 40. And at the end time, what end time? What end time has been end time all along? This is a message for your people, Daniel. At the end time, the king of the south will collide with him. So I know the king of verse 36 is not the king of the south. And the king of the north will storm against him. So I know the king in verse 36 is not the king of the north. Okay? So we got this king 
that both the Seleucids and the Ptolemies are, are fighting out of their territory, and it doesn't work with horsemen and many ships, and, and he will enter countries, overflow and pass through. He will also enter the Holy Land. So we're looking here at the end time. Uh, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids fall at the hands, or at least cannot prevail against this king of verse 36. Uh, he enters the beautiful land. He enters the beautiful land. I wonder what the beautiful land is. There's no question, is there? This is how God saw what his people should be what, and what their, uh, the, the Eden, Edenic, as it were. Carrying on in chapter 12 of verse 1, it says, Now at that time. Have you, have you given a thought to what that time might be? Uh, that uh, 1140 is not the time on the clock. That's supposed to be 11 in subscript 40 or superscript. Chapter 11, verse 40, see, at the end time. Now at that time, we, we, the chapter break is arbitrary. We, we haven't changed thought. We haven't changed content. At the time that the Romans entered the land... At that time, Michael, the great prince who stands over the sons of your people, over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of great distress, such as has never occurred since a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone found written in the book, will be rescued. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. I, I, I can't help but think of, of uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. Is that, was that five, 10, zero? Okay, I'm almost there. I might take five more. <laughs> um, I can't help but think that the work of the Holy Spirit, breathing life, uh, and then in Acts 2, okay, so many will awake at that time. In, in verse uh, 4 and then in 9 and 10, Daniel was told, seal this up. You seal up this message, how long? Until the time of the end. Now, I know it says until the end of time, but somebody uh, <laughs> got carried away. It is not the end of time, it's the time of the end. I mean, you, check it out in any, any Hebrew book, it, it's the time of the end. Many will go back and forth, and knowledge will increase. Remember what uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, or Matthew might be commenting on this. Let the reader understand. Let the reader understand what? Let the reader understand what? Daniel. Here, seal it up until the time of the end. Then people will understand. You see the power of that? The time of the end is when people could read Daniel and understand what he's talking about. And Matthew 24, 15 says, read Daniel and understand what he's talking about. What does that tell you? That's the time of the end. That the end that has been talked about throughout this book. In Daniel 12, at verse 7, he asked, how long until the end of these wonders? How long? And it's a simple answer, but it's not really. And time and times and half time is what, to, what he was told. Uh, time, times and a half time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be accomplished. Who's going to shatter the power of the holy people? Verse 36, 1130, the king who entered the, prom, uh, the, the beautiful land was going to shatter the power of the holy people and then everything would be done. The end would come. And so the end came. A complete destruction of the holy peer, people. Now, I, I didn't deal with uh, go to your way. I, I just a couple, couple quick thoughts. In, in verses uh, 11 and 12, uh, there will be 1,290 days, but then how blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1335. I don't know exactly what Daniel is talking about. I think I do, but I'm going to give you an idea. Matthew 24, 13. He who endures to the end will be saved. I give you that idea. It must be right because I got a bobblehead up here going, yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and then I got myself into trouble on verse 13. And this was before I understood what resurrection was. I just knew what the text taught, right? 
And so, but as for you, Daniel, go unto the end. Then you will enter rest and rise for your allotted portion at the end of the days. And I had somebody in class say, you mean Daniel rose from the grave then? And I had to honestly say, I don't really know the explanation, but I do know this. I know what the end of the days is. Daniel is so abundantly clear, you can't miss what the end of the days is. It's when Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Now, working from there, I could figure this other thing out. But I didn't let my presupposition nullify the power of the scriptures. You've got to do it that way. You're going to come into places where you, I, I just can't make sense of this. But these things I know are true. Let me then work this out to see what it means. All right, let me share with you then the concluding ideas. A, 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 a clear decreed end dominated the book of Daniel. Number two, it pertained to Daniel's people, city and temple. It didn't pertain to the whole world. It pertained to Daniel's people, city and temple. It, was, it came upon them in their last days when Yahweh sent Rome to finish the decree that he had made. And so we say again, last days are past days. They're long past. They're long past. And that is my understanding of Daniel's last days. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Appreciate that good lesson. I didn't get to hear all of it. I had to run home, take care of some pressing business. But uh, I got in, got in on the last bit of that, and that was just really, really good. Uh, especially that development there in the latter part of Daniel chapter 11. And, uh, you know, he, he's absolutely correct when he, when he says that those are some troublesome texts for an awful lot of people. All right, uh, folks, as you can see.